I don't want to do that too long. <laughs> Are we ready, Fred? All right. Hey, good morning, Mount Hall. It's nice to see your bright faces today. Uh, it's nice to be seen, isn't it? We live in a good place. Do you guys know that? How blessed we are to live up here in North Idaho? Do you know that there are churches in other states that they're being told that they're not allowed to sing? They're not allowed to praise the Lord. Can you believe that? I thank God every day for this wonderful state that we live in. Let's keep it that way. Let's open in a word of prayer, shall we? Father, we come to you in Jesus' name, the only name under which salvation can be obtained. We just thank you and praise you for this opportunity to come together as a church family. Lord, we just ask that you would bless our time of worship together, Lord, and you would receive our worship, that you would inhabit the praises of your saints. And Lord, I just ask that every aspect of this service this morning would be glorifying to you. Lord, we pray for all those pastors, particularly in California, who have been told that they cannot allow their congregation to praise unto the Lord. Lord, I ask that you would make them strong during this trial, as that's not only unlawful, but it's unbiblical. And so, Father, I just ask that you would give them strength and cover them and protect them, Lord, that you would be glorified through this whole ordeal. We thank you, Lord, and we praise your name, and we ask it all in Jesus' holy name. Amen. So this morning, we are proud to recognize, and there's going to be a, a picture up on the screen here in a second, Sergeant Pete Leonard, United States Marine Corps, retired. And you might see Pete back there. He is wearing his dress blues. Pete is a combat veteran and combat wounded in the Vietnam War. And yesterday, because we didn't have a parade here in Bonners Ferry, but they had a parade up in Eastport, and Pete was, our own Pete Leonard was the Grand Marshal. So thank you, Pete. Way to represent. What? That was in Bonners. Oh, you were the Grand Marshal of the protest parade? I thought you were up at Eastport. You're just the president of the whole community, Pete. Anyway, thank you for your service, and thank you for representing. We're proud of you, Pete. Now, this is normally both potluck and communion Sunday, so I'm not going to tell you guys that you can't eat. There are snacks and there's food downstairs after the service, but out of an abundance of caution, we were figuring, well, since we've got, we've got the baptism and barbecue next week, I'm not going to make a big deal of it, but at the same time, after service, there's snacks, there's coffee, there's leftovers downstairs. Please partake and, and say hello to your church family because we're not going to live through this, this weird time that we're living in. We're not going to live in fear. God is on the throne, and he is in control. But this morning, we get to partake of, of communion together, and that means common union, that we are the church of Jesus Christ. We're our brothers and sisters in Christ. So if you didn't already get one of the little cups when you were coming in, and I, I didn't, <laughs> uh, could you raise your hand, and I'll have the... Did you hide one on me, Jim? You did. Ah, he did hide one. Never mind. If anyone didn't get a communion cup, would you raise your hand? And the usher will bring one up to you. Thank you very much, Terry. Appreciate that. Now, next week, as I said, we're going to go down after service, and we're going to take over Twin Rivers. We're going to have our church picnic and barbecue and baptism. So it's all outdoors. We have the uh, pavilion area, which has refrigerators, so bring a side dish. If you want to bring a dessert or bring something like yesterday, my bride made our own uh, keto-friendly ambrosia, which is kind of like a, a mixture of uh, cottage cheese and different types of fruit. It was really good. So if you have something like that that you want to share, immediately after service next week, we're going to go down to Twin Rivers. The church is going to provide the hamburgers, the hot dogs, and again, like I've been telling you guys, if you have something that's kind of strange and exotic, that you have in your freezer. Maybe your wife won't let you cook it. This is the time. Bring it out. We'll throw it on the grill and we'll, we'll, we'll call it mystery meat. It'll be fun. Anyway, you cut it. So if you partake of children's ministry and we have kids here at Mount Hall, we have a, a really good children's ministry program where we use Answers in Genesis curriculum, but we're looking for additional Sunday school teachers. So pray about this. 
If you have a kid that uh, loves going to children's ministry, pray about if God is asking you to serve in that capacity as well. And also, the women's retreat, we're going to have a women's retreat this year, despite all the coronavirus scares and everything. It's going to be August 21st through the 23rd at Camp Luther Haven down in Coeur d'Alene. So see my wife. Raise your hand, Cheryl. If you're interested in going to that, see her for sign-ups. It's going to be an awesome, awesome time. And at this time, if the ushers will come forward to receive this morning's tithes and offerings, please. Father, we thank you and praise you. We come to you in Jesus' name. And Lord, we just ask that uh, during this time where we get to give back to you, that you would multiply these funds tenfold and that you would use them to reach the whole world with the gospel of Jesus Christ. We love you, Lord, and we thank you and we praise your name. And we ask it all in Jesus' holy name. Amen. Now this morning, we are also blessed to have a, have a, not a, have Gil and Linda Hernandez join us. Now they served on the worship team at Calvary Chapel Costa Mesa in Southern California. They've been up here now for about a month and a half, two months, and they're looking at relocating permanently. So I've asked them if they would share with us in worship this morning. And I was going to pay them, kind of like what you would do with a, a guest past, pastor, where a pastor gets honorarium, but they wouldn't see of it. They said, no, give it an, unto the Lord. So join us. Stand together if you would, if you feel like it. If you don't feel good or you have problems with your legs, then sit down, but be comfortable. But let's worship the Lord together. Guys? This first song was taken from Acts 16, which um, Pastor Bob has shared with us a little while ago. Um, and this is kind of what I think maybe happened with Paul and Silas when they were in prison and how they worshiped the Lord. began to see 
Wasn't that awesome? Praise the Lord. You may be seated, gang. Thank you, guys. That was, that was incredible. Gil, do you play the bagpipes, too? <laughs> Love it. <laughs> well, this morning, we are blessed to be able to partake of communion together. And this means that, as a church family, we are breaking the bread of Christ. And we are also remembering his great sacrifice, his blood that was spilled. So as the elements of communion have already been handed out to you, uh, let's just take a moment and sit and reflect. Take a moment to pray. Look inside. And if there's anything that you need to get right with the Lord on, let's do it now. In 1 Corinthians chapter 11, verse 23, the Apostle Paul, writing to the Corinthian church, and he's setting in order things which they were doing wrong, things that they were doing incorrectly. They had turned the Lord's Supper into a, basically a big party. And he writes in chapter 11, verse 23, For I received from the Lord that which I also delivered to you, that the Lord Jesus, on the same night in which he was betrayed, took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, Take, eat, this is my body which is broken for you. Do this in remembrance of me. So let's take apart our little all-in-one cup container here. And of course, I pulled the whole thing apart and I went right, to the, went right to the grape juice. So let's see if I can get the upper part done. Now, on this one, you'll see that it's a wafer. It's in wafer form. I'm going to be talking about this more in my message this morning. If this were Jewish matzah bread, you would see where it had little piercings and little stripes on it, reflecting what was done to the body of Jesus Christ. So let's hold the bread before us. Father, we thank you for your shed blood on the cross through your son Jesus, Lord. Thank you for loving us so much that you first died for us so that we might live. Lord, we remember the sacrifice that you paid on the, on the cross, how your body was broken and bruised for our transgressions, for our rebellion. So, Lord, let us live as unto you at, because you died for us. We thank you and praise you, Father, and we ask it all in Jesus' holy name. Amen. Amen. Let's partake together. In 
In the same manner, he also took the cup after supper, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. This do as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. So as we're going to hold the cup in front of us in just a second, the covenant per se is not referring to our canon of scripture like the New Testament or the New Covenant. Instead, this is a new agreement between us and God. And God knew that we could not keep this agreement. That's why Jesus died for our sins. Because we could not possibly be good enough. We couldn't uh, do it in our own righteousness. So by the breaking of the bread, this is a picture of the covenant where we, both parties, pass through and agree to keep this unto penalty of death. That's essentially what it means. So as we hold the cup, remember the blood that was shed for our sins. Father, we, we come to you again in Jesus' name, Lord. We remember your sacrifice again on the cross. We remember your battered body and how your blood came down the side of that cross, that old hickory wooden cross. Lord, and that, that red crimson blood is what washes us as white as snow. So that when, Father God, when you look at us, you see us through Jesus' shaded glasses. And I'm thankful for that because I am not a good man. Not, not according to your standards. There's no way I can be good enough. So, Lord, we, again, we choose to live for you because you died for us. And we thank you for doing this, that you loved us so much. And we ask it all in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's partake together. And lastly, the last part of this is a warning to us. In verse 26, it says, For as often as you drink this, or excuse me, as often as you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death till he comes. Therefore, whoever eats this bread or drinks this cup of the Lord in an unworthy manner will be guilty of the body and blood of the Lord. But let a, let, let a man examine himself, and so let him eat of the bread and drink of the cup. For he who eats and drinks in an unworthy manner eats and drinks judgment to himself, not discerning the Lord's body. And this is why we take a moment and we reflect and we get ourselves right with God. And if we have relationships that we need to mend with family members, friends, loved ones, that kind of thing, we try to do it as best as we can to be at peace with all people. Amen? So at this time, we're going to release the kids to go downstairs for Children's Church. And it's Miss Alethea this morning, so let's pray to ask the Lord's blessing on them. Father, we come to you in Jesus' name. And Lord, we just ask that you would pour your Holy Spirit out on these little ones right now, Lord, that you would plant your word deep in their hearts, that they would follow and serve you all the days of their life. And Father, I pray for Miss Alethea. I ask that you would bless her, that you would give her clarity of thought, that you would keep distractions far from her, Lord, and that you would use her in a mighty way. And I ask it all in Jesus' holy name. Amen. Okay, little ones, this is the time. Make your way to the center aisle. And everybody else, turn in your Bibles to Acts chapter 20. Acts chapter 20, if you would, please. A Chinese man and a Jewish man were eating lunch together one day. Suddenly, without warning, the Jewish man gets up and walks over to the Chinese fellow and smashes him in the mouth, sending him sprawling. The Chinese man picks himself up, rubs his jaw, and asks, What in the world did you do that for? The answer comes back, For Pearl Harbor. His response is a total astonishment. Pearl Harbor? I didn't have anything to do with Pearl Harbor. It was the Japanese that bombed Pearl Harbor. The Jewish man responds, Chinese, Japanese, Taiwanese, they're all the same to me. With that, they both sit down again, and before too long, the Chinese man gets up and walks over to the Jewish man and sends him flying with a hard slap to the jaw. The Jewish man yells out, what did you do that for? And the answer comes back, the Titanic. The Titanic? Why, I didn't have anything to do with the Titanic. Whereupon the Chinese man replies, Goldberg, Feinberg, Iceberg, they're all the same to me. <laughs> a little bit edgy. Acts chapter 20, beginning at verse 1. After the uproar had ceased, Paul called the disciples to himself, embraced them, and departed to go to Macedonia. Now when he had gone over that region and encouraged them with many words, he came to Greece, and he stayed three months. And when the Jews plotted against him, as he was about to sail to Syria, he decided to return through Macedonia. 
And so Peter, a Berea, accompanied him to Asia. Also Aristarchus and Secundus of the Thessalonians and Gaius of Derby and Timothy and Tychicus and Trophimus of Asia. These men going ahead waited for us at Troas. But we sailed away from Philippi after the days of unleavened bread, and in five days joined them at Troas, where we stayed seven days. Now on the first day of the week, when the disciples came together to break bread, Paul, ready to depart the next day, spoke to them and continued his message until midnight. There were many lamps in the upper room where they were gathered together, and in a window sat a, young, a certain young man named Eutychus, who was sinking into a deep sleep. He was overcome by sleep, and as Paul continued speaking, he fell down from the third story and was taken up dead. But Paul went down, fell on him, and embracing him said, Do not trouble yourselves, for his life is in him. Now when he had come up and taken and broken bread and eaten and talked a long while, even until daybreak, he departed. And they brought the young man in alive, and they were not a little comforted. Father, we come to you again in Jesus' name, Lord. We ask that you would amplify the word to us this morning, that you would set aside everything that's going on in our lives, that we would be able to focus just on what you have for us this morning. I pray for a fresh filling of your Holy Spirit right now, and I ask, Lord, if I say anything that is not of you, it falls to the ground unheard. We thank you, Lord, and we praise you, and we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. So last week, we studied about the riot at Ephesus, and remember, it's a riot. It's not a peaceful protest or a mostly peaceful protest because we need to call what it is, it is. So remember, this was a great tumult, and the tumult was about a lie. It was all about nothing. It was st started under false pretenses, and it was started to attack the church of God. Much like the riots that we're experiencing in America today that are being led by Marxists under a pretext or an excuse, they take a valid concern over racism, and we should all be concerned about that because people are people and they all need to be treated the same. But at the same time, they take the ball and run with it and make it about destroying our very way of life and our nation. Now, our laws here in the United States, of course, are based on English common law, and those laws were based on the Bible. So ultimately, the laws that we have and the laws of our land are from the Bible. That's the source. And remember also, we studied about the rapture last week, and that's the great snatching away, the violent snatching away of God's church before the very wrath of God is poured out on the unbelieving world. Now, this is called the great and terrible day of the Lord. And when it's talking about that, the great and terrible day, it's not a day, but it's a period of time. In this case, the great tribulation is one week of years, or seven years, seven years, 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, verses 1 and 2 says, But concerning the times and the seasons, brethren, so it's talking to the church, you have no need that I should write to you. For you yourselves know perfectly that the day of the Lord so comes as a thief in the night. So it will come when we're not expecting it. And most people are going to be asleep at the wheel when this happens. They're not going to know what's going to happen. The world will be completely caught unaware. But the Christian, as a member of Christ's body, we should be aware. We should know. And when we say, Lord Jesus, come quickly, we should expect that things are going to get worse. They're not going to get better because all this is taking place to set up so that the Antichrist can come in as soon as the church is removed. And Jesus is truly coming back and coming back very soon. So this morning, we continue in our line upon line and word upon word study of God's word. My message title is The Dangers of Sleeping in Church. <laughs> so let's dig in. Acts chapter 20, verse 1. Some of you guys are convicted already. I get it. <laughs> After the uproar had ceased, Paul called the disciples to himself, embraced them, and departed to go to Macedonia. And of course, this uproar, this is the, the riot that we were talking about, and it was caused by Demetrius. Do you notice that the world will take things and they... What they do what's called minimizing. They'll take something and they'll brand it a little bit differently. So again, instead of talking about a riot, it becomes a protest. Now, all people tend to do this. If you're talking about a child that steals a pack of gum, instead of stealing the gum, they'll say, I took it, because it's easier for them to wrap their head around it. I took it rather than stealing. Instead of a person saying that they committed adultery, 
on their spouse. Instead, what do they say? I had an affair. An affair sounds much, much better than adultery, doesn't it? Now, I learned this principle when I was serving as a police detective. They sent me to interview school, and I remember this old detective from San Diego. He told me, don't use words like rape and robbery and murder. That jacks them all up. Instead, minimize the offense. Talk to them in such a way that they can accept it. And that's exactly what the news media is doing today. So think about what the, the media used to call a suspect of a crime. They call it a suspect, right? That's where they came up with this from the cops. But now what do they call a person that is suspected of a crime? Not a suspect, but a person of interest. So you see that minimization taking place all across the board because suspect just sounds so harsh, it sounds so bad. And we as people, we are convicted of our own, own shortcomings. We're convicted of it because it boils down to this. It's sin, and it's hard for us to face our own sin. So we minimize it. Now, after these riots, after they stop, Paul knows that it's time to leave Ephesus. He has been there for three years. So he calls all these disciples together. He calls the brethren of the church, and he says his goodbyes, and he embraces them. And this tells us what? There was genuine love that was going on there. These were church family members. Oftentimes, as Christians today, we tend to have more personal relationships with people in the church than we do even with our own family, our blood relatives. Many of us, when we get together at family, family get-togethers like uh, Christmas and Easter, sometimes it's tortured when we have family members come from out of town. But when we come in and we commune together in church, you notice how easy it is, how easy the mantle is, how we get along with one another. So then Paul, he hits the road. He's back on the mission field, and he leaves by boat. And he goes across the Adriatic Sea. The Adriatic Sea separates what's modern-day Turkey today from Greece. And then he goes over to Macedonia, and this is located over in eastern Greece. Verse 2, Now when he had gone over that region and encouraged them with many words, he came to Greece. So Paul spent this time, and he went from church to church, encouraging them, edifying them, building them up. No doubt he answered questions that came up about doctrine and how do they do this and how do you do that? How do you deal with sin? Paul would have also preached or exhorted them. And these are all churches that he helped start. These are the churches that are named in Acts chapter 16 and Acts chapter 17 that Paul helped plant. This, of course, would include Philippi, Thessalonica, Berea. And Paul would have looked at these churches or these people like his kids. Because when you have a part in pouring into somebody's life or you get to lead somebody to Jesus Christ, you look at them like your kids. Or when you get to come alongside a new Christian and edify them and build them up, they become like your kids. They become part of your family. You love these people. So our text says this morning, it says Paul stayed about three months. And this may help explain a mystery. And what I mean by that is Paul records in his book to the Roman church, in Romans chapter 15, verses 18 and 19, for I will not dare to speak of any of those things which Christ has not accomplished through me in word and deed to make the Gentiles obedient in mighty signs and wonders by the power of the Spirit of God so that from Jerusalem and round about to Illyricum, I have fully preached the gospel of Christ. Now, Illyricum is a strange little obscure country that we know today as Albania, or the Albanians call their country in their own tongue, Sheptar. This was controlled for a good portion of our modern history by the Ottoman Turkish Empire. They recently, in the last hundred years, they got their freedom again. So if you go to Albania today, you know that 98% of the population is uh, by tradition, Muslim. We have missionaries in Albania, the Hoja family. They, they serve and minister there. Remember, we had Shelly Zadina come and share at our church about what is going on in Albania. So yet in the book of Acts, Paul's journey into Illyricum is not recorded. And that's because part of the time, Dr. Luke, who wrote down everything that happened at Acts, he wasn't with Paul, not through the entire journey, and I'll talk about that in a couple of minutes, but he summarized what Paul had been doing. So it's very likely that this is the place in those three months of time that Paul went up to Illyricum or Albania and ministered to the church there, or established a church there. Verse 3, and stayed three months. 
And when the Jews plotted against him as he was about to sail to Syria, he decided to return through Macedonia. So this is once again a place where Dr. Luke gives us a brief summary. And when we last saw Luke, he was left behind at the church of Philippi. Remember, that was back in Acts chapter 16. Remember, Paul and Silas had been in jail there. And we sang about it this morning. When they were released from their chains, they went on. They took Timothy and went on and went on to the next city. But they left behind Dr. Luke. Dr. Luke continued to pour into the church and minister to them. Now, this shows us a couple of things about Paul. First of all, Paul had the heart of an evangelist. He wanted to preach the gospel where no one had ever been before. He was a church planner. And so also, by leaving Dr. Luke behind, it shows us, secondly, that we see Paul's pastor's heart. He doesn't want to just leave new believers flopping around to care for themselves on their own, but he leaves a seasoned Christian behind to pour into them so that they wouldn't be trying to feed themselves as babies, as infants. So Dr. Luke stayed, and he discipled the church there in Philippi, and now we see where Dr. Luke is once again joining our missionary journey. Now God had spoken through the prophet Jeremiah in Jeremiah 3.15, and I will give you, this is of course referring to Israel, but applies in this case. I will give you shepherds. Now the word in the Bible that's used for shepherd is the same thing as pastor. I will give you pastors or shepherds according to my heart, God says, who will feed you with knowledge and understanding. So that's what Dr. Luke would have been left behind to do. And this also shows the nature of Paul's heart. Paul would pour into these guys and teach them and train them. He was training up his replacements. And when you're working on a, on a job in the, in the uh, civilian world, a good, a good boss will always cause you or ask you to train up your replacements, to share your job with somebody else so if you have to call in sick that day, the job doesn't shut down. It's just good business sense. And Paul was certainly one. He was a shepherd. He cared for the sheep. And if Dr. Luke did not go with Paul to Albania, it explains why he didn't record this mission trip in the book of Acts. Verse 4. And so Peter of Berea accompanied him to Asia. Also Aristarchus and Segundus of the Thessalonians and Gaius of Derby and Timothy and Tychicus and Trophimus of Asia. Now, I don't expect you to remember all these guys' names. Now, if you were reading in the Daily Manna in our Bible through the Year program this morning, you would have seen that we went through in, in uh, First Chronicles a whole bunch of genealogy names. And I bet some of you were laughing because I do this on Facebook Live every morning, except for Sunday morning. You laugh at me when I say some of these names. These names are tough. So as I'm going through these Greek names, they're not much easier. So I'm not going to test you on these guys, but we see two guys that are mentioned in here that were mentioned last week. One of them is Gaius. And the other one is our guy, Aristarchus. Now, these named, men named here are Paul's travel companions. There were seven of them total. And they are trusted by Paul. They're brothers in Jesus Christ. Now, something that's really cool and very interesting is this name, Aristarchus. From his name, it gives us a description of who this person is. It tells us about his character and his background. The name itself means best ruling best ruling. And if it sounds interesting, if it sounds like something you've heard before, you're absolutely right. We get our English word aristocrat from it. And it tells us this man who was Greek was well born. He was wealthy. He was probably from nobility. He was from the ruling class, hence the name best ruling. So then we have this other brother that's named Segundus. And if it sounds kind of like the English word second, you're right. It was common in that day that if a person was a slave, when they either bought their freedom or they were freed by their master, that they wouldn't keep their slave name, but they would take a new name. So just like we sung this morning, we're all, as Christians, we're going to get a new name. In this case, Secundus, his name meant second. Now, there might have been another slave that was in their party or in the church. Maybe his name was Primero or Primo or First, essentially is what it meant. But when a slave won his or her freedom, they would take a new name. When the slaves that were taken against their will from Africa and taken to the United States, when they gained their freedom through the Emancipation Proclamation, they took the names of the people that they had lived with. In many cases, they're slave owners, but 
A lot, of, a lot of what happened in the South as well is there were poor white sharecroppers that they would live alongside, and those sharecroppers, they might have taken their names so that they would have a new name and not be called by a slave name. Same name is happening here. In this case, this man's name means second. And it shows us that in Jesus Christ, in the church of God, we have a whole bunch of people who are gathered together who wouldn't normally get together and hang out. We're from different races and ethnic backgrounds and all this stuff. But except for Jesus, we wouldn't all be in the same room. He is a uniter of all things that are different. We have different people from race, different races, different professions, different socioeconomic backgrounds, different classes. And we all have one thing in common. Jesus Christ is our Lord and Savior. And isn't that a wonderful thing? Matthew chapter 12, verses 49 and 50 the words of Jesus, he says, Here are my mother and my brothers, for whoever does the will of my Father in heaven is my brother and sister and mother. So Paul and these seven travel companions, they were family. They were brothers in Christ, just like we are brothers and sisters in Christ this morning. And this also reminds me, as I said just a minute ago, when we're freed from this life, when we're freed from this body of sin in this world, you and I are going to get a new name. The Bible tells us this in Revelation 2.17, the words of Jesus Christ. He who has a, an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. To him who overcomes, I will give some of the hidden manna. Manna means, what is it? It's bread from heaven. And God will only give you enough for the day that you're on, usually. And I will give him a white stone, and on that stone a new name written, which no one knows except him who receives it. So we're all getting a new name. Just like in the Bible, remember Simon, son of Jonah, he became Peter. And then we had Joseph, remember Joseph? Joseph, his name became Barnabas, or son of encouragement. I wonder what your name is going to be. I wonder what my name is going to be. I hope it's not Gumby. That was a nickname I got in the academy, and I never liked that name. But to be an overcomer, as it says in the scripture, as what Jesus said, he who overcomes... I will give all this, these things. An overcomer, if you have someone that you know, or maybe one of you might have this middle name, Nicholas, Nicholas. Nico means a conqueror, an overcomer. And what are we overcoming? Our sin nature in our body through the power of God's Holy Spirit that he pours out on you when you come to a saving knowledge of Jesus Christ. He does this so we can live victoriously and overcome our sin nature. Verse 5. These men, and this is the magnific Magnificent Seven, I'm going to call them, going ahead, waited for us at Troas. So this is Luke recording that they still stayed behind there at Philippi, but the seven other travel companions went ahead. They sailed in another ship, and they went ahead, and they waited for them. So we see these seven companions here. Now, who is writing this book again? Dr. Luke. So again, this points out when he says we... This Gentile believer, it's indicating that he is now leaving Philippi with Paul, with Timothy. Well, Timothy's already gone ahead, and now he is rejoining the missionary trek. He stayed a period of time in Philippi, but now he's rejoining once again and going on with Paul to Jerusalem. So he is writing as he sees things once again in the first person. So Paul comes back through Philippi, Luke joins him, and they sail off to Turkey. Now, if you look up on the screen, you're going to see a picture. This is of Paul's third missionary journey. And we see where Paul originally, when he started out, he leaves Ephesus. He goes over to Thessalonica. And then he travels down to Corinth. He goes down the coast to Corinth. And then he reverses course and goes back up north to Berea. And then east over to Philippi again. All of this to avoid the plot by the Jewish religious leadership who are out trying to kill Paul. And then he takes the boat back from Asia. Now, Paul, again, as we looked at, he covers a lot of miles, a lot of territory. According to Bible scholars, probably about 10,000 miles, most of which was on foot. <clears throat> Excuse me. How would you like to walk 10,000 miles on foot? That wouldn't be fun, would it? But you know that today there are several different religious groups that still try to silence what Paul said in the scriptures. The first being the Evangelical Lutheran Church in America. They call Paul's, uh, his epistles into biblical authority. In other words, did he really write them and are they, are they inspired? Why do you think they would do that? 
because the evangelical Lutheran church has been ordaining homosexual priests, homosexual ministers, essentially. And Paul, in his epistles, writes the most about any of the apostles about the sin of homosexuality. Who else? There's another group that attacks the epistles of Paul and, and is really dead set against them. You might know them as the Hebrew Roots Movement. Now, this group is kind of an offshoot of the Seventh-day Adventist church, but the Seventh-day Adventists don't go as far as these guys. And what they are, they're made up primarily of Gentiles or non-Jews, and they will ask Jesus Christ to be their Savior. They combine grace, but then they also follow the Jewish laws. So the laws were given to the Jews, right? They were not given to the Gentiles. Remember, we talked about this. Remember James the Just, the half-brother of Jesus, and the church council in Jerusalem sent the letter on with Paul and the other brothers and said, the only thing that we, re we require of you is that you don't eat meat that's offered to idols, you don't eat meat strangled, and you stay away from sexual immorality, period. Not that you have to keep the law, you don't have to convert to Judaism. And then this group also holds that there's a different path for the Jew to obtain salvation, that they can do it by following the law. But that's not what the Bible says either. Paul, in his letters, makes it very clear that both Jew and Gentile were not saved by keeping the law. We're saved by the grace of God. We're saved by having faith in Jesus Christ alone. Hold your place here in Acts and turn over to Romans chapter 3, if you would, please. Romans chapter 3. Romans chapter 3, beginning at verse 19. Now we know that whatever the law says, it says to those who are under the law, that every mouth may be stopped, and all the world may become guilty before God. Therefore, by the deeds of the law, no flesh will be justified in his sight, for by the law is the knowledge of sin. So the law convicts us of sin, and none of us are good enough to keep the law. The Jews, the Pharisees couldn't keep it. They broke it. Verse 21, but now the righteousness of God apart from the law is revealed, being witnessed by the law and the prophets, even the righteousness of God through faith in Jesus Christ to all and on all who believe. For there is no difference, okay, both Jew and Gentile. For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God, being justified freely by his grace through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus, whom God set forth as a propitiation by his blood through faith to demonstrate his righteousness. Now that propitiation is a fancy word. We are a Christ was our substitute. If he hadn't paid for our, our sins on the cross, we would have had to pay for it. As a propitiation by his blood through faith to demonstrate his righteousness because in his forbearance God had passed over the sins that were previously committed to demonstrate at the present time his righteousness that he might be just and the justifier of the one who has faith in Jesus. Where is boasting then? It is excluded. By what law? Of works? No, but by the law of faith. Therefore, we conclude that a man is justified by faith apart from the deeds of the law, or is he the God of the Jews only? Is he not also the God of the Gentiles? Yes, of the Gentiles also, since there is one God who will justify the uncircumcised, excuse me, will, circ will justify the circumcised by faith and the uncircumcised through faith. Do we then make void the law through faith? Certainly not. On the contrary, we establish the law. So in short, the law, the Old Testament, shows us where we fall short, that we need a savior, that we can't possibly do it on our own. Now, there's a lot of pastors today, they refuse to teach from the Old Testament. And they say, well, we're the New Testament, we're only going to teach from the New. You cannot teach the full counsel of God without also teaching the Old Testament. But the law, that was given to the Jew. If you're not a Jew, it doesn't apply to you other than that is our foundation. That's what the church was grafted into, as Paul says in Romans 11. We are grafted in olive tree. So there is no other way to get to heaven except through the blood of Jesus Christ by his name. Acts 4.12 tells us, nor is there salvation in any other, for there is no other name under heaven given among men by which we must be saved. So Paul reverses course, and he goes back through Philippi and then hops on the boat to Asia. 
Verse 6, But we sailed away from Philippi after the days of unleavened bread, and in five days joined them at Troas, where we stayed seven days. And so Paul's seven travel companions, the Magnificent Seven as we call them, they go on ahead to Troas, but Paul and Luke, they stay behind and they partake of Passover and the Feast of Unleavened Bread there, there at Philippi with the church. Now the Jews traditionally would celebrate Passover and the Feast of Unleavened Bread together, right on top of one another. Exodus chapter 12 details this, and of course we see the same thing demonstrated when Jesus was crucified. And we see now that Paul, even though that he was a Christian, and even though Paul was saved by grace, saved by faith, he still, as an ethnic Jewish man, celebrated and observed the Jewish feasts. As a matter of fact, to the Jew, the Israeli, the native-born Jew, this is a commandment, a perpetual commandment. Exodus chapter 12, verse 17, and it's on the screen, So you shall observe the feast of unleavened bread, for on this same day I will have brought your armies out of the land of Egypt. Therefore, you shall observe this day throughout your generations as an everlasting ordinance. Now, if you look through the Old Testament and the law, you'll see this named in a couple of different places where it says, if you're a native-born Jew, this is for you. So even though Paul was saved by grace as a Jew, he observed the feasts. And of course, the Old Testament feasts all point to the New Testament. Because the Old Testament in, is the New Testament. In the New Testament, it's revealed. And the New Testament is in the Old Testament concealed. For instance, the Passover, that points to Jesus as our Passover lamb, our once and for all sacrifice. The Feast of Unleavened Bread, we talked about it at communion this morning with the, the matzah bread. It has both stripes and it has holes in it. It speaks of his body, the piercings and the stripes that he received while he was being punished for our sins before his crucifixion. And the feast of first fruits, okay, that the Jews celebrated that, that was the feast of harvest. What we know today is Pentecost. Do you know what Pentecost is, church? It is the birthday of the church. Do you know that you're the first fruits of Jesus Christ? That you're his first fruits. So bottom line, Paul wanted to make it to Jerusalem to observe the birthday of the church, a birthday party. And our passage this morning tells us it took five days of sailing to go from Philippi, Philippi south to Troas. Now, if you remember back in chapter 16 of Acts, on the second missionary journey, and this trip in reverse, it took Paul only two days of sailing. Acts chapter 16, verse 11 says, Therefore, sailing from Troas, we ran a straight course to Samothrace, and the next day came to Neapolis. So two days going there and five days coming back. Now imagine this boat. Imagine the ship that Paul and his party was on. It had no plumbing. It probably, the food, it wouldn't have been anything that was cooked, or if it was, it was very rudimentary. Uh, it would have been miserable. There was no quarters. They would have been sleeping on the deck, or perhaps under the deck, there would have been water sloshing around. You would have been horribly seasick, and if they hit adverse winds, this would have been very tough sailing. So this would explain why after five days at sea, they would need a little time to rest and recoup, wouldn't they? So they stayed seven days. Verse 7 says, now on the first day of the week. What day is that, gang? Sunday. On the first day of the week, when the disciples, the church, came together to break bread, Paul, ready to depart the next day, spoke to them and continued his message until midnight. So this is Sunday, the first day of the week. Now today, you're going to see a lot of well-meaning Christians, and they'll come up and say, well, I see in the Bible, I see in the Old Testament that the Sabbath was on Saturday, and it does say that. But the Sabbath, the one on Saturday, was given not to the church, but to the Jews. It was given to those under the law. So in the New Testament, we do not see a single instance where Gentiles, non-Jews, Greeks, were commanded to worship on a Saturday or to observe the law. As a matter of fact, we are told not to pass judgment on another because of a day or because of how they might eat food, what, what they eat and what they don't. Paul writes in Romans chapter 14, verses 5 and 6, and it'll be on the screen. One person esteems one day above another. Another esteems every day alike. Let each be fully convinced in his own mind. 
He who observes the day observes it to the Lord, and he who does not observe the day to the Lord, he does not observe it. He who eats, eats to the Lord, for he gives God thanks. And he who does not eat to the Lord, he does not eat and gives God thanks. Paul also says over in Colossians 2, 16 and 17, So let no one judge you in food or in drink or regarding a festival or a new moon or Sabbath, which are a shadow of things to come, but the substance is of Christ. So the fact that Paul and his travel companions get together and worship and break bread together on a Sunday is cool. It's neat stuff. And it also shows us it's a model for us today as the church. Now, Paul and other Jewish Christians, it was typical. It was very common for them, even though, again, they're saved by grace, not by the law. But they would go to the synagogue on Saturday. And they would worship there with the other Jews. Remember Paul's heart. He would always go first to the Jew and then to the Greek. He would share the gospel first to the Jew and then to the Greek. So they would go to synagogue on Saturday and then worship with the Gentiles on Sunday. And really, we as the church, we should worship the Lord on every day. There's no, no indication that we only worship on one day. If you want to walk with the Lord, if you want to have a solid relationship with him, we should all be worshiping him every single, worshiping him every single day of the week. Now, for the most part today, most mainstream Christi, Christian churches worship the Lord on Sunday. Why? Because Jesus rose from the dead on Sunday. Hence, it's known as the Lord's Day. And this passage of Scripture is an example of just what the, the church was doing at the very beginning. Back in Acts 2.42, it said, And they continued steadfastly in the apostles' doctrine, in fellowship, and the breaking of bread, and in prayers. That's what we do when we come to church. We fellowship. We hang out with one another. We go downstairs and eat donuts and drink coffee with one another. We pray with one another. And we worship God and we get into his word. And that's what we see taking place today, this morning, as we hang out together, our church family. And then it says Paul starts teaching. And then he teaches some more. And then he's still teaching. He teaches until midnight. And you guys know from up here, up on the pulpit, I see everything and everyone. I see when you start nodding off. Typically on a Sunday morning, most folks are good for about 30 to 45 minutes max. After that, you begin to lose them. I see the eyes getting heavy. I see the eyes close, and then the head tilts off to one side, and then the mouth comes open, and before you know it, they don't even know what's happening. <sighs> the sound of snoring. I get it. It's hard to sit down there, especially when it's warm during the summer or in the winter when the, the heater gets turned on too high. That's why you always see me in Hawaiian shirts. I try to stay as cool as I can. But it's hard to listen for, to someone for that period of time. And then we see in the next verse, we see a contributing factor, why it's so easy to nod off. Verse 8, there were many lamps in the upper room where they were gathered together. So these oil lamps, and they probably would have been made using uh, olive oil to fuel them. Now, first of all, two things would happen. As the church is getting together in this upper room, you have a lot of people together in a small space. So on a Sunday morning, the first thing that I do, particularly in the summer, is I come in and I make sure the air conditioners are on. And the ladies will say, oh, it's so cold in here. But wait, it won't be. Because as soon as people start coming in, the temperature rises. You can't help it. So with the saints in there and the lamps, it's going to raise the temperature inside the room. It's going to be warm. And secondly, they could smell the fumes from these lamps, kind of like aromatherapy. There's some smells that make you sleepy all by themselves. So between the temperature and the smell in the room and the late hour, folks were getting sleepy. Our guy Eutychus. Verse 9, And in a window sat a certain young man named Eutychus, who was sinking into a deep sleep. He was overcome by sleep. And as Paul continued speaking, he fell down from the third story and was taken up dead. Okay, so this is on a Sunday, remember? And this is in the Greek world. This is the Gentile world. Sunday was a work day. These guys all had to go to work first, and then they came to church that evening. So they, after going to work, they spent a whole day working, they come to church, and we see why Eutychus fell asleep. 
And I can relate to this. I really can. We had friends over last week, and we stayed up to the, the late hour of 10 o'clock, and we were like, wow, we're like really adults. Most of the time, Cheryl and I will start to shut things down. We'll make coffee, and we go off into our bedroom and watch ridiculously stupid TV starting at about 7 p.m. until we drift off to sleep. We're truly old people. So what we see here is this guy, Eutychus, he's sitting in a windowsill. Now it's late. Remember, it's warm in there. There's a lot of people in there. He's probably hoping that that cool air is going to keep him awake. You ever been driving late at night and you're trying to get home and you're in the car and the car is warm and you start to fall asleep and you either jack the air conditioner on or roll a window down? It might even be snowing. You're doing anything you can to stay awake. This is what's happening to Eutychus. He is fighting it. He is fighting it, but it's overtaking him. It's coming over the top of him. He cannot stay awake. And then it says he falls from the third floor down to the ground. So even under the standards of the day and thinking they probably had lower ceilings, we're still talking about anywhere between 30 and 36 feet that he fell from that window down to the ground. And when he fell, this didn't put him into a coma. It didn't knock him out. It killed him. He was dead. It said he fell to his death. Falling asleep in church is not a good idea. It's not a good thing. And Eutychus demonstrates the dangers of falling, in church, of falling asleep in church. Now, years ago, when I was in the Sheriff's Academy, back in the summer of 1982, those days were long. In the evenings, they were long, too. Morning inspection was every morning at 0700 hours. That's 7 a.m. to most folks. And it was followed immediately by PT, which included a five-mile run in formation where we had to call out a cadence. So a cadence, if you've ever been in the military, you know what that is. It, it's used to try and get you more wind so you're not going to run out of steam so quick. And then it was in classroom all day until 1700 hours or 5 p.m. And we, once an hour, every hour, we would get a break and we would run out of the classroom, go to the bathroom, hit the bathroom real quick, and then back into the quad and guess what we did? Push-ups push-ups until we, we got inspected and they'd always find something wrong. So we were doing at least 50 push-ups, oftentimes more. It got us in shape, that's for sure. And then we, we were back the next morning doing the same thing again. Plus two nights a week, we had what was called practical problems and they started at 7 p.m. and went till 11 p.m. And that's where you would go out and you would pretend to take like a radio call between a husband and wife, a uh, husband wife fight or an armed robbery in progress. And then you'd have instructors that would judge you on how well you did or didn't do. And so then we had to start the whole thing over again the next morning. And plus on the weekend, we each had to volunteer to work a shift in the county jail system free of charge. That was what was required of us to get through the academy. So I can understand falling asleep. It was hard to stay awake those days in class. And one day, there was this one particular instructor that came in, and he had been a tactical officer. His nickname was the Skull. Now, a tactical officer is the same as like a drill inspector or drill instructor in the military. And this guy was famous. If he caught anybody in class nodding off, he would throw a full can of soda pop at you or a stapler or whatever he could find. And typically what I would do when I'd start getting sleepy is I'd take my briefcase and put it up on my desk and open the briefcase and kind of hang around it. And of course, we had our snacks in there. And if they found anything in your briefcase that had sugar in it, God forbid, you were in a whole lot of trouble. So we tried not to fall asleep in class, just like Eutychus when he was falling asleep in church. Now, the great Bible teacher John Wesley told of a story once where he caught a parishioner nodding off during service. And John Wesley yelled out, fire, fire, which caused the man to jump wide awake. And he stood up and says, where is the fire? And then John Wesley said, fire and, for, fire and hell for those who sleep during the teaching of the word of God. So sleeping in church is not a good idea. But even worse than falling asleep in church is this. It's sleeping in our walk with Jesus Christ. We need to have our eyes wide open, saints, to what's going on around us in our world today. 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, verses 6 and 7 says, Therefore, let us not sleep as others do, but let us watch and be sober. For those who sleep, sleep at night, and those who get drunk are drunk at night. 
So with what's happening in the world today, we don't know the hour or the day that Jesus is going to come back and get us, but we are told to be aware of the times and seasons. They are warnings to us. Never, uh, never before in our history have we seen such a convergence of events where you have pestilence and everything, all the, the wars and rumors of wars and riots, and everything is happening at once. Do you notice that this year? It's crazy. So this is a warning to us as the church to watch and be ready. Jesus is coming back very soon. Ephesians chapter 5, verses 14 through 16 says, Therefore, awake, you who sleep, arise from the dead, and Christ will give you light. See then that you walk circumspectly, not as fools, but as wise, redeeming the time because the days are evil. The coronavirus, as I mentioned, the nations that are surrounding, the, the enemies that are surrounding Israel right now are all those nations that are named in Ezekiel 38 and 39. This is a battle that has not occurred yet, and that could happen at any moment. The riots, as I mentioned, in our nation, all this instability, the division on political terms. We are so widely divided as a nation, it's no longer even close. There's no such thing as a centrist anymore. There are people that are either on one side or the other. And unfortunately, what it's becoming is traditional Americans against Marxists. So it's a wake-up call for us as the church. We are not to be woke, but we are to be awake and alert and looking for the return of Jesus Christ. Verse 10 in our text. But Paul went down, fell on him, and embracing him said, Do not trouble yourselves, for his life is in him. Now when he had come up, had broken bread and eaten, and talked a long while, even until daybreak he departed. And they brought the young man in alive, and they were not a little comforted. So that's like saying they weren't just a little comforted, they were a lot comforted. They were overjoyed because this guy was dead. And then Paul, after doing this last great miracle by healing this man, by the power of God's Holy Spirit, he leaves. So Paul goes down, he falls on the man, the man, and he heals him. And Eutychus wasn't asleep, he was dead. God woke him up. And I bet that man, he never fell asleep in church again. I'm sure that was a real wake-up call for him. Now this morning, I hope that you all have your eyes wide open, that you're aware what's happening in the world today, and that your eyes are fixed heavenward, so that you are awake and sober during this dark time. Jesus said in Matthew 24, verses 32 and 33, Now learn this parable from the fig tree. When its branch has already become tender and puts forth leaves, you know that summer is near. You also, so you also, when you see these things, know that it is near at the doors. So that fig tree is representative of the nation of Israel. And those leaves have been, been green and on the trees since May 1948, when Israel was reestablished. And Jesus is coming back very soon to rapture his church out of this dark place. Are you ready? I hope so. The Bible says, Jesus says in John 3, 3, Most assuredly, I say to you, unless one is born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. Now, being born again means simply this, that you're not following after religion. It doesn't matter if you were born a Canadian or American or a German or whatever, and your family by tradition was Christian. It means each man and woman must decide for themselves and put their faith and trust in Christ alone. Believe that Jesus is who he says he is, the Son of God and God eternal. Believe that he died for your sins and that he's alive today. Believe that you and I are not good enough that we sin on a daily basis and we need a Savior. And ask him to be the Lord and Savior over your life and forgive you of your sins. And then hold on for the ride of your life. Shall we stand together? Shall we pray together? Father, we just thank you for this time that we've had to spend with you. We thank you for your word, and your word is true. And Lord, I just ask that uh, you would have your hand on every person here today, that you would bless them. If somebody is kind of half awake, that you would wake them up, Lord, that their eyes would be fixed on you, that this would be a time to be ready and waiting and on fire for you, doing about your business, not our own. So, Father, I just thank you and praise you for this time that we've had to spend, Lord. And I just ask that if there's any that have never asked you to be their Lord and Savior during this last song, that you would come down and pray with us. Also, if you have things that are going on in your life, if you need uh, prayer for healing, 
or prayer for uh, reconciliation with a loved one, whatever's going on, come down and pray with us. We thank you, Father, and we ask it all in Jesus' holy name. Amen.
So this morning we're going to do something a little bit different. Rather than just read you the benediction, as I mentioned that these guys were from Calvary Chapel, Costa Mesa, so we're going to sing the benediction the way that Pastor Chuck Smith used to do it. So bear with us and sing along. There's a, there's a men's part and a girl's part. Okay, men, we're old. They're always girls. It doesn't matter. So the girls follow Linda. Okay. It's and just I'm gonna, an echo. I'm going to hang Nick next to Gil here because he knows it a lot better than I do. The Lord bless thee. The Lord bless thee. And keep thee. And keep thee. The, the Lord, Lord make his face to shine upon thee. And be gracious unto thee. And be gracious unto thee, the Lord lift up, the Lord lift up, his countenance, his countenance upon, upon thee, and give thee peace. Father, we just pray your blessings on each and every person here today, that you would watch over, give them peace, and keep them safe, Lord, until we meet again. We thank you, Lord Jesus, and we ask it all in Jesus' holy name. Amen. God bless you guys. Have a great week. There will be snacks downstairs. I hope to see you down there. Have a great day, everybody.